thank you so much for being patient, everyone. <laughs> so welcome to our citizen science seminar, our second one actually in February. I'm Professor Carrie Fioramonte. I teach biology in the natural sciences. Today um, we have our uh, one of our former wildlife biologists, Mike Brim, presenting to us about contaminant studies in St. Andrew Bay. Um, before uh, Mike, you get started, I just want to make sure that I also introduce our partners in this endeavor, Citizen Science uh, Baywatch. Uh, I have Michelle and Regina here. They are co-presidents or president and vice president? Uh, just board members. Board members, board members. Um, did you want to say anything now or do you want to... I, no, I don't want to take any more time. Yes, I want to, let's, we'll get started, but yeah. I hope that you guys will stick around because I do have a couple of things that I want to share with you about upcoming citizen science and some other events that are happening. And I know Baywatch would also like to share some things with you as well. So without further ado, I give you Mike Brew. Okay. Uh, today I want to present in gen very general terms what we did last year, how we spent the, the county's money, the state's money, to go out and assess and evaluate the sediments of St. Andrew Bay. Where do I have to point this flipper to get it? I'll just do it for you then. Next slide. Oh, you'll have to do it for me? Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, from the RMA, this is 2-22-22. You could be anywhere today, and you've chosen to be here, and I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time to focus on this and, and to be here. Uh, so from the RMA, we, we thank you. Next slide, young lady. This is a big production. Uh, the credits uh, written and directed by me. Our producer in denial is Christina Cantrell. <laughs> My objection producer is Jim Barklin. And then we will have pro production consultants and cameos by Charlie Brown, Bill LaCat, Opus, and Snoopy. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, right off the bat, I want to go to the first point to ponder, and that is the scallop in St. Andrew Bay. Historically, they were plentiful at a lot of locations throughout the bay. But scalloping has not been allowed harvest of commercial or recreational since the 1990s. The scallop population has had 30 years to bounce back even with uh, 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 transfer of, of new scallops from places like St. Joe Bay. So the question is why? Why if you quit dragging for scallops, why if you quit harvesting scallops, has it not come back? Water quality doesn't give us a clue. Uh, sediment quality doesn't really reveal uh, a, an answer, a smoking gun. But there is something going on. And in the most recent administrative code, St. Andrew Bay isn't even on the map for scalloping. This, this code defines a line from the center of Mexico Beach due south. Anything west of that line, you can't scallop. Not in St. Andrew Bay, not in Santa Rosa Sound, not in Pensacola Bay. Bingo, done. So we're going to focus on that flag species as one of the reasons why we've got to solve this problem. Next slide, please. And of course, that's the base scallop. Next slide. I'm going to have to get around here because. I, I didn't realize I was going to have this pretty assistant standing behind me that was going to control everything. Uh, a little bit about the history of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service contaminant program. Mr. Barkaloo, as I said, came into my office in the mid-1980s and asked me to launch the program. Next slide. 
and so and so we did. Uh, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service launched a national chemical contaminant program at field offices across the United States, freshwater and saltwater. And our office produced in 1998 a three-volume report, the Environmental Contaminants Evaluation of St. Andrew Bay. So we have some baseline data from which to evaluate today's or last year's sediment quality. Uh, we also did in 2002 a dioxin and furan compounds in the sediments of the Florida Panhandle. We looked at dioxin hard. And we did a water quality survey report for potential seagrass restoration in West Bay and we'll talk about the loss of that thousand acres as the second big injury, scallops and then the loss of a thousand acres of seagrass. Next slide. The basics of sediment sampling. I'm going to try to kind of give you an idea how this works. The first thing you look at in a sediment sample is the nature of the sample. And it's generally defined into three categories. Sand, and then the next smaller grains, the silts, and finally, the finest grains, the clays. The clays particularly attract metal contaminants. They like to bond onto that uh, electronic surface. But of course, silts can accumulate a lot of different compounds because they're in the middles. Quartz sand, you couldn't contaminate if you tried to. So there's really no point in taking a sediment sample in the shallows where the wave action has sorted it and it's just coarse sand. That's a waste of analytical money. So we focus on the silts and clays. Next slide. And there's another part, and that's the organic fraction of the sediments. When the turtle grass leaves decay or anything else, a portion of that sediment is generally total organic carbon. And for St. Andrew Bay, that normal average is about 4%, about 4%. If you see unusually high percentages above that, and you are near a location of a paper mill effluent discharge, you can be pretty sure that that additional organic carbon is coming from the paper mill. So we would look at stations that had seven, eight, nine percent total organic carbon as a clue that part of that total organic carbon was not natural. It was coming from the paper mill. Okay, next slide. We had uh, 33 stations in this study. 16 of them, I'm going to walk you through these, are in Lower St. Andrew Bay. And I define Lower St. Andrew Bay to be anything south of the Hathaway Bridge or the DuPont Bridge. That's Lower St. Andrew Bay. Next slide. The first one was at uh, Port Panama City, right out front. We always check that to see if there's been any accumulation of contaminants in the sediments due to shipping and cargo handling and those sorts of things. It's an industrial site. Next slide, please. The second station is an open bay station. You can see where it is, just south of the St. Andrews area of town. Third slide. The th station three is right in the middle of the lower bay. And, and the, now the sediments out at that point, you're, you're in about 40 to 45 foot depths. You're into good mud, good organic stuff. Next slide. Then we picked a deep station in Grand Lagoon near the mouth. We couldn't do all of Grand Lagoon like I wanted to, uh, so we had to take one station as a kind of an evaluation point. Next slide. The same thing with station five down here by the Tyndall Marina. This is where the historic entrance of St. Andrew Bay used to be, and we'll talk about the loss of that. We'll talk about the change behind Shell Island from a flowing inlet to a seven mile long dead end lagoon, okay? And that's a whole different thing uh, uh, hydrologically. 
Next slide, please. This is one of our team members from the University of South Alabama, Dr. Wayne Isfording. We needed a top-notch marine geologist, and Wayne was the, that, that fellow. He did all of our, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service grain size analysis. And, uh, and he's still working, and he hopes to get over here. He, Wayne's now, um, he'll be 85, 86, something like that. He's young. He's young, Barkle. Next slide, please. Stations six and seven are open bay stations, but these are stations in the ship channel where the Corps of Engineers would routinely do maintenance dredging. That's why we were interested in what's going on where the Corps is going to dredge, because that leads, of course, to disposal of the dredged materials. Next slide, please. Uh, this is station six, about uh, relatively southwest of the city marina in deep water, and Station 7 is just uh, southeast of the city marina, just uh, west of Redfish Point in the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. Next slide. This is one of my favorite stations, Lake Caroline, just off of Beach Drive. This is the lower impoundment. It is has received stormwater runoff uh, historically from the city of Panama City. And the city of Panama City really, when I moved here, the population of the city of Panama City was about 35,000. Today it's about 35,000. Uh, we were at build out. Not much has changed in the city of Panama City municipality. And uh, this used to be uh, Caroline Bayou until we put two dams above it and they act as stormwater retention ponds. If you dam something up, you're providing a treatment pond for the bay. So we evaluated Lower Lake uh, Caroline. Next slide, please. Uh, there, and there's the location on, on Beach Drive. That's land, landmark apartments and the marina. Next slide, please. Uh, stations 9 and 10. Now we get to where the rubber meets the road. We're in Martin Lake. Station 9 is in the lower Martin Lake. Station 10 is about in the middle. And right here you have the paper mill waste disposal area that has been there since the 60s. It has received sediments from the clarifiers forever. And when they were using elemental chlorine to bleach paper. One of the byproducts was dioxin. And dioxin, we'll talk about what a simple molecule it is, but here's the deal. Dioxin is extremely hydrophobic. What does that mean? It wants to get out of the water. And it is an electronically neutral molecule it wants an electronically neutral surface to attach to, and that's the total organic carbon. There's a lot of carbon in the paper mill from the pine trees, so that historically that stuff was loaded with dioxin. And if you think I'm speculating, we could go to the paper mill over on the Fen Holloway River where we actually got the EPA to look at the sediments. They were analyzing the water for dioxin. We said, that's nuts. You're not going to find it at parts per quadrillion in the water. And yet, you're allowing total suspended solids that I think it was 70 milligrams per liter or something. And I did the arithmetic, and that, that worked out to be two eight-ton dump trucks per day dumping organic carbon into the Fen Holloway River under permit. So we finally got the EPA to look at those sediments in the lagoons, and they were sky high with dioxin. I said, yeah, that's where the dioxin is. It's in the total organic carbon. It's not in the water. Chasing it around in the water is, is nuts. So this location and these two stations are, are important. Not just now, but in the future. And uh, Christina, I think we were talking about, there has been mentioned converting 
Martin Lake back into Martin Bayou. That re means removal of the dam and letting it connect. So whatever contaminants are in the sediments of Martin Lake, whatever contaminants are in that waste pile that is, if the, if the mill ever closes down, that will be the next Superfund site. There's not much doubt about it. Next slide, please. Hurricane Michael. <clears throat> At that location, Hurricane Michael had winds blowing from the north and then from the west, probably at around 130 miles per hour, from the west to the east. Can you imagine what that did to that unstabilized waste pile blowing things into Martin Lake? There's just no way of, of escaping the power of that hurricane. And are we going to have another hurricane this year? Our chances are just as good as ever. Probably not, but who knows? Who knows? Next slide, please. Uh, this is me in my backyard, what's left of it. I had three 100-year-old oak trees in my backyard, and I live right over here in Forest Park about halfway between the college and, and downtown. And sadly, that's what happened. North winds, north winds, because of the ro counterclockwise rotation, that's what happened in my backyard. And I live six miles west of the paper mills disposal area. OK, next slide, please. Uh, Watson by stations 11 right up here behind the paper mill, 12 in the center and 13 down by the mouth, and the confining bar. There is a confining bar 12 feet deep that confines things that are in the area of station 13 that is about 25 feet deep. If you ever go in there and dredge out that confining bar, you're going to get it down to the depth of whatever sediments are actually in Watson Bayou and allow them to flow out. So if there was a proposal to deepen this channel and remove that bar, that's almost the same as removing the dam at Martin Lake. These are things that you have to think about in the future. We also, because of the, um, the marine shipbuilding, this was one of the locations that, for the first time ever, we looked at organo tins, and we'll talk about that. Next slide, please. Uh, Massalina Bayou, uh, Bayou Joe's, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it historically has had a lot of industrial activity, mostly smaller stuff. We suspected back in the 80s that historically there was something like a battery facility up at the end, not there now, but when we looked at the sediments, they were pretty high in cadmium, you know, and I thought, well, where the hell is this coming from? So, so we have three stations in Massalina Bayou. Next slide, please. Points to ponder number two. 42 years ago, Mike Brim said, on any given day, you can find anything in St. Andrew Bay. At that time, I was teaching a little course at this college with the adjunct faculty entitled The Sea Life of St. Andrew Bay. And I taught that course for about 15 years as an adjunct faculty member. And I loved it. I just loved it, loved it, loved it. Uh, and I said that the first night. Now, I'll digress real quickly. First night, we were in the Ken Sherman Auditorium, down the older building down there. And it was free. And so I had been talked into teaching this, and I had prepared this two-hour lecture, and I had never done that before. And I had my slides and all this. And I thought, oh, I'm so nervous. I'm going to just pass out. And the people started coming in. Well, the Ken Sherman Auditorium seats 65, and they were standing room only. Amazing what people can do when it's free, you know, just. And uh, I. I thought, oh, I, how am I ever going to do this? But I, I made it through that lecture, and that's when I said that about this next photograph. 
We're going to go back even further to about 1948. These five guys, including Bill Lee, who was the brother of our secretary at the Fish and Wildlife Service at that time, Ruth Lee, and his buddies had been out shark fishing in the bay for a couple of days in two big rowboats with rope and chain and big hooks off of Redfish Point. The third day rolled around and the, the, the guys in the first boat said, ah, forget it, it's too hot, we got nothing. So Bill and his buddy went out off of Redfish Point and they hooked two huge fish, one at one end of the boat and one at the other. And they thought, well, what the hell are we gonna do now? So they had to cut the one loose and they focused on the other one. They got it finally in towards shore by Tyndall Point, Redfish Point. A couple with the Air Force was walking down and the four of them managed to wrestle this 12 foot sawfish in up onto the beach. The, this is undoubtedly the largest sawfish ever captured in St. Andrew Bay. A couple of others around eight foot. I mean, sawfish are rare in the first place. So I submit this as evidence that on any given day, you used to be able to find anything in St. Andrew Bay. Next slide, please. Uh, hurricanes, uh, Eloise, Opal, particularly in 1995, and Michael, closed the East Pass Inlet. Dr. Isfording predicted that in 1990 that it would be closed in five years. He hit it right on the head because of Hurricane Opal. We used to shark fish right here. There was a, an inlet at the uh, northwestern end of St. Andrew Sound. But when Hurricane Eloise came through, she busted the uh, barrier right here, and immediately after this inlet closed, and we lost our shark fishing place out of Tyndall. That's what hurricanes do. They punch holes. They change everything. They they uh, they're they're very dynamic. Next slide, please. Uh, we have six stations in East Bay, and I'm going to talk about those. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an overview. We have two of them up by Eastern Shipbuilding's facility in East Bay. We have one in a bayou, Shoal Point, one in a bayou, Callaway Bayou, north, and then two down here in deep areas that had historically had elevated percentages of total organic carbon. And we suspected that was due to the paper mill. So we had these stations near the DuPont Bridge analyzed for dioxin, suspecting that that elevated percentage of total organic carbon would have the dioxin attached to it. And, and we were right at the time. Next slide, please. So up here with the shipbuilding, this is two of the stations that we also did uh, organic tin, organotins, because that's a uh, historically a very toxic anti-fouling compound applied to the hulls of boats. Next slide, please. Uh, up here in Shoal Point or Fred Bayou, back in 19, uh, well, yeah, I'll, his next slide will tell you. Uh, we went in there to doing routine studies, and we had had real low traces of background DDT and DDE and stuff, real, real low. We went into this bayou and we had eight to 10 parts per million parent compound DDT. I said, whoa. So I called the, the manager at that time of the forestry and natural resources, my friend Bob Bates, and I says, we must have screwed up, Bob, because we have these elevated levels of DDT in Shoal Point Bayou. He said, no, as a matter of fact, you didn't screw up because that's the location where we warehoused and stocked and stockpiled barrels of DDT. And there's also an old dump right here. And he said, I'll bet you what happened when they outlawed DDT, that the unopened barrels were trucked off to a disposal area. And the partially filled barrels were probably thrown in that dump. So what you're finding is accurate. 
And the Air Force went back in and found even higher levels. And this one little bayou and that one little sample launched the Attenal Air Force Base equivalent to their Superfund program. And a whole new uh, operation out there to look at contaminants on Tyndall was launched by the investment of one sediment sample right there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is, this is simply the history of what I just talked about. Next slide, please. Uh, Callaway Bayou. Well, obviously, we're interested in our, in our bayous because they receive most of the storm water and it settles out there. So we want to know what the water quality is and Callaway Bayou was one of them. Next slide, please. These are the two stations uh, east of the DuPont Bridge that we were looking at. Suspect for maybe dioxins still being there. Next slide, please. Hey, Charlie Brown, I've got more. There, it, oh, she's asleep. I lost my audience. <laughs> anyway, okay. Then we went to North Bay and to Deer Point Reservoir. For the first time that I know of, we looked at sediment quality in Deer Point Reservoir. Uh, Station 23 was northwest of the site where we extract the water and then send it down to the treatment plant. Uh, so we had Station 3 in Deer Point Reservoir. Next slide, please. Uh, now a little bit about the history of this, and Mr. Barkley was involved in this. There was a pre-construction uh, uh, survey before they built the dam. It was in the early 1960s, so that it used to be that where Deer Point R Reservoir is now used to be part of St. Andrew Bay. It was part of North Bay. In fact, it was the most productive area we had for oysters. We had a lot of oysters up there. Uh, so life's full of trade-offs. And we traded off those oyster beds for a source of potable drinking water. So it's extremely important that we have good water quality and good sediment quality in Deer Point Lake because we're all drinking that water. Uh, and also, because we put the Deer Point Dam there, we created one of the biggest stormwater treatment ponds to protect the bay ever. Because what happens with sediments, particularly, they settle out in calm water. With, if they're in heavy, they, they settle out. So next slide, please. So if we have urban development around Deer Point Reservoir and stormwater that transports contaminated sediments or water into Deer Point Reservoir, those sediments are going to accumulate in the, in the reservoir. Uh, uh, hold on this for just one second. And where I come from, where I was raised uh, in Salt Lake City in the Rocky Mountains, we had reservoirs that were sources of our drinking water. And they had rules out there, you don't go into that watershed. We wouldn't even think of building in it. You don't get to fish in that reservoir. You don't need, get to hunt in that watershed. You, that, that area, that watershed for that reservoir is off limits for everything. No development, nothing. <clears throat> in this case, we have allowed urbanization, fishing, water skiing, waterfront development on our drinking water source. And that's something to ponder. Next slide, please. Newman Bayou uh, is a typical bayou. Uh, I think this photograph was 2010 or something, because you can see there's hardly any development when this aerial photograph was taken. Next slide, please. But there is something to consider. Here's Newman Bayou and our station, and here is the uh, Gulf Power production plant, uh, now Florida Power. Uh, you probably noticed in your, in your bill, a little change. Uh, but they had a disposal area here, about 160 acres. Next slide, please. 
and it was for fly ash, bottom ash, and low volume waste. It's important that that waste be confined to that area and not allowed to enter into the bay, and that someday it be transported off to a proper disposal site. Uh, I don't know of any problems that are, leap out from this situation. I simply point out that near North Bay, near Newman Bayou, this facility and this disposal site exists. Next slide, please. Uh, we couldn't do all of the, the bayous up in North Bay, so we picked a station right here in the middle that will receive uh, impact from Mill Bayou, Beatty Bayou, Anderson Bayou, Hodges, Gator Bayou, and the water coming over the dam, and we called that the Five Bayou Station. And it can't give, gave us an idea. We had to make compromises because of economic uh, limitations. Next slide, please. Uh, Station 6, uh, Goose Bayou. Gotta love Goose Bayou. Uh, and I could tell you stories about a young dolphin up in there that just, they were doing complete flips. It was beautiful. This used to be where the airport was, of course. Now it's development. This is deep water here, and while there's not a marina there right now, I would bet probably a lot of money that one day there is a marina to facilitate that whole development there. It's a perfect location for a marina as far as hydrologic conditions. So we want to keep a close eye on that. Uh, and uh, you can see the Venetian Villa development here. So it's another bayou that we want to keep a close eye on and make sure that our stormwater actions are adequate. And Christina and I believe they are not quite adequate. We have strong feelings about increasing our investment in stormwater protection. Next slide, please. Robinson Bayou. Gotta love this little bayou, too. It used to be a boat manufacturing place there. And in the 80s, we had elevated copper wouldn't surprise you if you were treating the bottoms of, of boats there. Uh, and of course, there's, there's urban development there. There are still some boat manufacturing going on here. So we want to keep an eye on Robinson Bayou and the activities going on there. Next slide. Uh, Pretty Bayou, we've never had a station in Pretty Bayou, but there's an awful lot of urban development. And Pretty Bayou, oh, could I go back one? Can you go backwards? OK, back to Robinson Bayou. At the head of Robinson Bayou is a drainage way. It's what we call the City Creek Canal System, or something like that when we did this, when, uh, when Best did their stormwater thing. It leads all the way to the Panama City Mall. It captures everything off of 23rd Street from the Panama City Mall and all that stuff down 23rd, and all the Forest Park stuff comes down a, a, a waterway that ends up in Robinson Bayou. So Robinson Bayou gets more than its fair share of stormwater contribution. Next slide, please. Uh, pretty Bayou, yeah, we're keeping an eye on that. Next slide, please. Up in the West Bay, our last five stations in West Bay. This one here, Station 29, particularly interesting. If you can see that yellow line that I have drawn across there, and you can go back to the 1960s and imagine that that line is a net, a confining net with quarter inch mesh to confine shrimp because this entire area is a shrimp farm grow out area, okay? And if you can imagine this little site being about a 10 acre parking lot with 55 gallon drums full of copper compound and, and one day in about 19, 89, I'm walking from my friend's house, Bob Jarvis, who is our biotech, 
I'm walking along the shoreline, and we come to this parking lot and building, block building. And the parking lot is just red, red as can be. And there's all these 55 gallon drums there. And I said to Bob, what the hell is this? Because I didn't know anything about it. He said, well, that's the Mara Farms net treatment area. That's where they treated the nets. Say what? Anyway, that net had to be constantly treated. Sections were taken out constantly and treated with copper and put back to confine those shrimp for about six years. Constant treating of a quarter inch mesh net, 10 feet deep, stretched across there. I forget, that's about a mile or so. Well, in this area right there, we documented with the help of the uh, aerial photography specialist with the US Geological Survey, what I had estimated at the loss of 300 acres of turtle grass turned out to be 1,000 acres of turtle grass, missing since the aerial photography in the 50s and 60s. It was there then, in the 1980s and 90s, it was gone. Uh, now, I can't prove to you absolutely, without any doubt, that the copper that was used barrel by barrel by barrel had anything to do with killing that 1,000 acres of seagrass, but I can't find anything else that's a really good hypothesis for the loss of that seagrass. And I haven't kept up with the seagrass surveys recently. We've got a, a proposal that would call for another seagrass inventory. But I would submit to you that that hasn't grown back in 30 years. That because it's so shallow, the wave energy then keeps resorting the, this, this sand. And little shoots that come up can't maintain a hold if that wave energy keeps battering them. And that's what happens. Seagrasses stabilize the sediments. If you take the seagrasses out, the sediments are in a dynamic nature and it's hard. I don't know how long it took to get these seagrasses in St. Andrew Bay. I only know one thing. 18,000 years ago, sea level was about 200 feet lower than it is today. And about 5,000 years ago, sea level kind of stabilized. So when people ask me, how old is St. Andrew Bay? I say about 5,000 years old, because that's when it stabilized. That's when the water rose and flooded the little creek areas to create St. Andrew Bay. When did the seagrass beds then establish? I don't know. Maybe it took 50 years after that 5,000 year point. Maybe it took 500 years. All I know is that it doesn't look like that 1,000 acres has come back in 30 years, and that worries me. That is a serious injury that we don't ever want to repeat. Next slide, please. H how much time have I got left? I'm probably running short. We usually end at 1.30, but um, we have to run until 2. So, well, well, so how much, what time is it now? <laughs> Oh, holy moly. <clears throat> okay, I've got to wrap this up in 15 minutes because I want 15 minutes for questions or dirty, dirty jokes. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, anyway, this is, this is what I was talking about, uh, about that Station 29. Next slide, please. Also in West Bay, we wanted to look at Crooked Creek and the sediments there. Burnt Mill Creek and the sediments there, and Warren Bayou and the sediments there, because this area is going to change more than likely. And why would I say that? Because of the location of an almost brand new Northwest Florida Beaches International Airport. And I would submit to you that the marketing engineers screwed that one up. If they had simply left off Northwest Florida, the word Northwest, and said Florida Beaches International, you could have all been flying into FBI. How cool would that be? JFK and FBI. <laughs> all right. That's
Anyway, so we're, we're looking at these bayous because of the potential for urbanization. It's, it's right there. Next slide, please. Uh, Crooked Creek, there's our, our station. 30 is right down here, just outside the mouth. Next slide, please. Burnt Mill Creek, it's down in the deep sediment area, just below the mouth. Next slide, please. And the same thing with Warren Bayou. This used to be the route for the discharge of thermally heated cooling water and whatever chemicals might be associated with that. And these are the old Mara Farms shrimp grow out areas on either side that were diked and confined and, and, and those dikes were never removed. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, Station 33, right up here, it's a sort of mouth of West Bay in uh, deeper sediments where we could capture the conditions in West Bay. Next slide, please. Hey, Bill, what do you think of my show so far? <laughs> OK, n n next slide, please. Picasso, Picasso, Picasso. That is our Ponar instrument chemical analysis sediment sampling operation. Now, it took us a long time to come up with that, OK? So we could call this thing Picasso. But we did it. This is a ponar grab. These are the jaws that go down to the bottom, sink down heavily. This weighs about 85 pounds. Sinks to the bottom. Christina pulls on the clip to remove the pin. It grabs, and with an electric winch, we lift that 100 pounds or whatever it is up there. And she swings it, she and her team, over into a stainless steel area on the back and then they process the sediment sample, put it in chemically clean glass jars, and they carefully ship it off to the lab for analysis. Also, there's a plastic bag for grain size analysis that they ship off for, for that too. So Picasso is how we actually get the mud down deep. Next slide, please. Any cruise you get back from is a good cruise. <laughs> this. This is me 50 years ago when I was in graduate school up on Long Island studying sharks. And that was a great two years, but I couldn't make a living studying sharks. I had to do something else, so I went to work for Barclay. <laughs> and that's just one of the sharks that, that we caught in Great South Bay. The, the most incredible two years uh, a, a marine biologist could ask for, except for being assigned St. Andrew Bay to work on. Next slide, please. Hey, Opus, later I'll mention endocrine disruptors. Freak! <laughs> Next slide, please. The chemicals. Real quickly, Jack Rudlow in his book, The Living Doc, quoted was saying, mud is good stuff. And it is. Good, rich bottom of it. It's good for flounders. It's good for shrimp. It's good for everything. Mud is good stuff if it's clean. Next slide, please. These are the metals that we looked at. I won't go down this list, but you can see we did a fairly robust look at metals. Next slide, please. And particularly mercury, we always keeping an eye on mercury because it can methylate. Next slide, please. Uh, and here's the thing about these molecules. This is easy stuff, folks. These are simple molecules. Here's mercury over here with one CH3 group, a carbon and three hydrogens. That's a methyl group. That's methyl mercury right there. That's the transformation that bacteria can make from elemental mercury into methylizing it, and it gets into the tissues of fish, and you've you got metal contamination. Methyl mercury, monomethyl mercury, bad, very, very bad. You add one more methyl group on that, and if you spill a drop of that on your glove in a lab, and it goes through and touches your skin, you will be dead in the next three or four months. Because we added 
one other methyl group to mercury. These are simple compounds. They're not, this isn't rocket science. And you can see by that that methylmercury is bad and dimethylmercury will kill you. And that actually happened to a researcher up in Boston. She was working with dimethylmercury. She accidentally dropped a bit of it on her glove. It went through the porous glove into her skin. And four minutes later, she died of mercury toxicity. Bad stuff. Next slide, please. Organotins and tributyl tin, very, very toxic. That's why it was outlawed a long time ago. It was great for keeping things from growing on the hull of a boat because it killed stuff. Kills stuff really good. Next slide, please. And this is just tributyl tin. Here again. All right, tributyl tin. These are, these are carbon atoms here, too, and that tends to make it a butyl group. My point is, these are simple molecules and extremely toxic. These are not really complicated protein or hormone molecules. These are simple molecules. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is tributyl tin oxide uh, with an oxygen in the middle and two tin molecules. And this is the molecule that they normally use to treat the hulls of the ships. And this is why at Eastern Marines facility up in East Bay and at Eastern Marines facility down in Watson Bio, we were looking at organo tin. Next slide, please. Uh, the polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons are a group. Here's naphthalene, for example. Make mothballs out of that. Again, a simple family of compounds. Next slide, please. Uh, and here's naphthalene, and here's methyl naphthalene, monomethyl naphthalene. That's toxic. That's really amazing. We found this over in Port St. Joe Bay, and the toxicity increases as you add methyl groups to it. And we found not only monomethyl naphthalene, we found dimethyl naphthalene, and we even found trimethyl naphthalene in the sediments in St. Joe Bay. And trimethyl naphthalene is extreme, extremely toxic. And it would, the samples came from right in front of the paper mill. So how is that industrial process related to the evolution of these chemicals in the outfall? Next slide, please. We did 60 semi-volatile organic compounds. Semi-volatile meaning that they can stay there some, and they can volatize and go up into the air. This was the first time we had ever looked at semi-volatile organic compounds in the sediments of St. Andrew Bay. Next slide, please. Anthracene is, is one of those. It also happens to be a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, or PAH. And it's anthracene, just one more benzene ring from naphthalene. That's all it is. Changes it. Next slide, please. These guys then, the chlorine atom and the methyl group, among others, are the bad guys. And you stick them on to anything. If you take a chlorine atom and stick it on a dioxin molecule where a hydrogen used to be sticking out there and you replace it with a chlorine atom, it starts getting more and more toxic. It depends on the arrangement, but these are the bad guys, the, some of the top bad guys. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, for the first time, we decided, uh, I said to Christina, let's look at all of the PCBs, because I had data, research data from around the globe that a lot of the PCBs, particularly to the lower weight PCBs, were very easily transported in air currents, atmospheric deposition. So for the first time we thought, well maybe St. Andrew Bay isn't just point source discharges, stormwater runoff. Maybe atmospheric deposition is something we ought to at least take a look at. So we did every, all 209 congeners, and by congener I mean a separate molecule, separate uh, individual molecule, of the PCBs. 
And we looked at all the stations. Next slide, please. And then, of course, we looked at the organochlorine pesticides, DDT, and all its friends. Next slide, please. And here's DDT, for example. This is not a complicated molecule. Toxic at, at the levels of parts per million, one or two parts per million, you can knock the hell out of everything. But nowhere near as toxic as dioxins at parts per trillions or PCBs at parts per billions. Each time I say that, you increase, you decrease the level of concentration by a thousand, okay? But this guy is usually toxicity at parts per, one part per million, two parts per million. Next slide, please. Go to dioxin, our friend, and, and here it is. Two benzene rings connected with two oxygen molecules, and out here at what's called the two, three, seven, eight positions on the molecule, chlorine. This is the most toxic dioxin molecule. This is the guy that was in the sediments of the paper mill there that was dumping stuff into the Fen Holloway River. This is the guy that in the sediments is toxic at parts per trillion, parts per trillion, okay? And so that's the dioxin molecule. And the worst one is one that has chlorine atoms at the two, three, seven, eight positions. But you could put a chlorine atom at that point, at that point, at this point, at this point. You can arrange them so you have octochloral dibenzodioxin with chlorine atoms at every position. And it's a thousand times less toxic than this guy. Next slide, please. And the only difference between a dioxin and a furan is we only bond with one oxygen instead of two. It's not tetrachloral dibenzo diox, dioxin or oxygen. It's uh, uh, two, two, three, seven, eight tetrachloral dibenzo furan. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, the name of the game in the world of chemical contaminants is this high accuracy and high precision. That's the work Christina's team did that has to be so exacting. The labs have to be so exacting. There has to be so much good quality control so that when you get the data back, you believe it. Next slide, please. Okay, first, and this is the end of my presentation, thank God. <laughs> first, the reassuring results from our report. Metal contamination is minimal in St. Andrew Bay, but poses some risk in three bayous, Martin Lake, Watson Bayou, Massalina Bayou. Organochlorine pesticides no longer present an ecological risk within the bay. How do you like that? DDT and its friends are not a problem anymore. We banned them a long time ago. Thank you, Rachel Carson. Semi-volatile organic compounds pose no significant risk at the four locations that we analyzed them for. Organotin compounds were not found at the East Bay stations. We'll talk later about it. And polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons were not found at levels to pose any significant ecological risk within the Bay system. So we've eliminated the organochlorine pesticides and we've eliminated the, the PAHs as being problematic in the Bay. That's good news. Next slide, please. Second, areas of concern. Metal contamination poses some risk in three bayous, Massalina, Watson, and Martin Lake. Organotin compounds are present and pose an undefined risk in Watson Bayou, near the shipbuilding facility, where the bayou's waters are more confining. They're not open like East Bay. Dioxins and furans are present and problematic in Watson Bayou and Martin Lake, but were no longer found to pose a concern at the open bay stations sampled in East Bay. 
Uh, they, uh, because years ago they shifted from elemental chlorine to chlorine dioxide, and now the current operation is mostly craft board and things like that. Things have changed. But we still have those problems in Watson Bayou and Martin Lake. PCBs were present at every location sampled. At many stations, PCBs in every molecular weight group were present, often at concentrations high enough to merit thoughtful consideration. So PCBs is something we measured for the first time, something we want to keep a close eye on, and something that's related to atmospheric deposition, regional distribution, national distribution, international and global distribution. So we want to keep an eye on those guys. Next slide, please. Five critical recommendations. Five Bay management recommendations made in this report are provided for the development and implementation of contemporary and long-range estuary management. So here we go. This is what it all boils down to for work. Number one, the biota survey. Assess the species health and population abundance and conduct a much needed biological inventory of marine life. This is urgent. A comprehensive assessment has not been done in nearly 50 years. Come on. What the hell are we doing, you know, if we're trying to manage an estuary? It's like ma managing a, a ranch or a farm. You don't know where the ducks are. You don't know where the chickens are. You don't know how many you have. You don't know how many cows or goats you have or how much pasture land you have or, or, or anything about it. This is, this is not a way to manage an estuary. Next one. Uh, no, our number two recommendation is stormwater treatment. Develop an intensive stormwater treatment program for urban and suburban areas around St. Andrew Bay. That's just a flat out statement. Several areas of identified contaminant concentrations should be further evaluated and a stormwater remediation plan developed for each. We're not letting off the gas on stormwater. We can't do that because we've got urbanization followed by urbanization followed by urbanization. Next slide, please. Chemicals of emerging concern. This is another place where the rubber hits the road. We need to identify, that's hard, and investigate chemicals of emerging concern, including endocrine disruptors. Uh, I'm sorry, but birth control pills and all kinds of other stuff, that can be bad for marine life, okay? And it's tricky, and it's complex, and we're not sure exactly which way to go. Next slide, please. And then to add to that, mixtures of chemicals. We don't know hardly anything about what a recipe with a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that would do to, for example, a recently fertilized scallop cell, okay? We don't know. And this is tough. This is tough. But that's, this is what Christina and I and the team, this is what we got. This is what we got. Next slide, please. Global stressors. For the first time, we realize that St. Andrew Bay is not isolated. No bay is an island. I don't know where in the hell that came from. <laughs> anyway, engage at the bay level with ecosystem stressors in involving atmospheric deposition, climate change, global warming, and sea level rise. This is the geographic level at which we have detected contaminant concerns and we concerns, and we must work with regional, national, and international partners to abate these stressors, whatever the source. We have to play our role. We have to be, do our part in harmony with people in the southeast and in, in other locations, whatever their work might be, and in the United States and, and in the global community. And it's a, a new paradigm for the RMA to think, well, in some ways, 
we have to be a global partner. And, and Christina and I have talked about it. There's that one lady, I can't remember the name of that organization. Yeah, the international Yeah, it's over in, uh, is it the Netherlands where their central office is? And they first started looking at the accumulation of, uh, I believe, it was PCBs uh, in the glaciers around Mount Everest and PCB content in the ice in the, at the North Pole and the breakup of that. And, and they realized these things can travel. Uh, and it, depending on the molecular weight of the, the PCB involved, which molecule it is, the heavier it is, the harder it is, of course, to transport by air. The lighter ones can get up as high as the top of Mount Everest. So, so those are our, our five recommendations. And I have how much time left? 1.44. So, so I've got 16 minutes. We really have the room until 2. I don't know that anyone's coming in. So that's well, I, 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 these folks are ready to go to lunch. And I know it and they know it. Uh, so we got about 15 minutes. I will try to answer any questions you might have at this point. Christina? Oh, well, yeah, that's a good slide. Okay. So, Mike, for some of the people either online or in the room who may not know, why is it important that you talk about the base gallop? Talk about what? The base gallop. Why is the base gallop important? Like the, is it oh, the, the, the baseline biodefs are very important? Well, the base gallop. The base gallop. Why is oh, the base gallop. I have my hearing aids in, too. Uh, the base scallop, I cannot overemphasize how important it is. It's a red flag. It's a warning species. If we cannot solve the mystery of what the hell is going on with the base scallop, how can we bring back any species? I mean, maybe the base scallop is one of the hardest species to bring back. I don't know. All I know is what this condition is. All I know is it does not appear that we can link any of the chemicals that we have so far analyzed for directly to impairment at some level of the life cycle of the base gallop. I cannot tell you what the closure of East Pass and the creation of a lagoon behind Shell Island and the change of those tidal current movements did to the distribution and disbursement of those uh, scallop eggs. But in answer to Christina's question, the base scallop is a good species to focus on. It's of recreational importance, so it's got that societal importance. It's of uh, economic importance, and it's one that because of the restrictions, because we've cut off harvest completely, because we've allowed 30 years to go by, we, we can pretty well state it's not over harvest. Not now. Over harvest may have led to this, but it's had 30 years to come back. There's something else going on, some mystery with mixtures of chemicals, with the 400 chemicals per month that are being newly developed, that are going into Tide and Dawn and, uh, I don't know, pizza dressing and uh, makeup and whatever. But we're, we're almost overwhelmed, and yet we have to try to solve this mystery, we have to try to correct this. And we have a proposal, and one component of it is to look at the base gallops. What was our budget? Was it 275000 or what was the? It was more than that um, once we added a lot of other stuff. So it was about 400000 so It's about 400000 What do you get for $400,000? Here's what the proposal is. It's a one-year study sampling every two weeks, and I think it's about 30 locations, gill netting, 
beach hall sing, and otter trawling, just exactly like the National Marine Fisheries Service did in the 1970s. Why? So we can compare as much as possible that data to a brand new biota survey conducted in basically the same way. And then it will be glaringly important if those 309 species of fish don't show up on the list, uh, we, we got some problems. You know, it, it fluctuates. I mean, 309. So maybe this study, we only have 258. We're, we're still in good shape. Our diversity of the bay, which it is known for, St. Andrew Bay's claim to fame is biological diversity. We have like over 2,000 species of marine life in St. Andrew Bay. That's, that's amazing. Uh, that's just incredible. This bay is so special as far as biological diversity and yet so delicate. We don't have a big river coming in here for positive flushing. And our, our solunar tides, we got wimp tides. We've got a, a spring tide, that's the, that's the maximum difference between low tide and high tide, 2.2 feet. Go to Brunswick, you got four to six feet to work with, the water going back and forth. We have wimp tides and no big river and a whole bunch of beautiful bayous and a delicate little ecosystem that was, bio, biological diversity was its claim to fame. So, plus the scallops. <laughs> I know I answered your question. Okay. Are there other questions behind you? Has to record what you said. Has funding been identified for your study, or is that up in the air? Lower your mask. Yes. Has funding been identified for conducting the study at this point? Christina? We're, we're, but. We do have the state looking for it, right? Or at least we've got an advocate at the DEP level. Uh, we have Mr. Muller at Bay County. We have submitted it to Jim Muller, so he, he got it with funding from the and, and didn't we get some funding from, uh, was it the National Wildlife Federation or? I applied for funding for, from NIFLA. But in answer to your question, no, the funding's not there yet. And we need, need quite a bit of that funding. There is also in the Biden administration, in his uh, uh, climate change and global thing, there is a component in that legislation for environmental stressors. And there should be some money in that chunk of the federal budget to, to fund this little bit. There's, there, he, there's probably I don't know, a couple of billion at least in that environmental stressor component of that big legislation. Uh, we need an advocate within Capital Circle, a strong advocate. I've been up there. I've, I, I fought for stormwater one time when I, we had created a plan at best that involved six municipalities and the county. And I went to Washington and Alan uh, Bentz told me at the time, he said, I'm worried about you going to Washington. And I said, why? He said, Cause you don't have a big enough hammer. And I know what he meant when I got up there, met with a senator and met with a congressman. And I couldn't get that funding. That was a stimulus funding. I couldn't get it for those six cities and the county. But that was the first time a proposal had ever been developed with all six municipalities in the county in one proposal. And that, that proposal was, I don't know, it was three or four million dollars, something like that, for stormwater throughout the area. So that's another source. But have we found the funding? Not yet. Are we gonna find the funding? You bet. I guess my, my follow-up, and you can just repeat this, Carrie, is like, what, what can we do to help? So what can we do? Uh, <laughs> You can write me a check for $500,000 today. Yeah. 
Now, I, I think the, the most important thing that you can do to help is spread the word. The most important, because you don't know who you might speak to who might be the pivot point. You really don't. It's like uh, selling any of my novels or whatever else that you're trying to pitch. Word of mouth is really effective. So the most important thing you can do is spread the word of what you've heard here today. If you believe in it, you believe in the RMA and its mission, spread the word. Because somebody you're going to come across, somebody we're each going to come across is going to say, hey, that's, that's really important. And I know somebody else. And we'll get there that way. That's the most important thing you can do. So I'm not running anyone off, but I have to go proctor an exam. So I wanted to just say a couple of things. First, we are recording this. Commodore Productions is actually recording this session. So if you'd like to hear it again or if you'd like to share it with anyone, um, that it will be coming soon and you can contact me or you can go to the Commodore Productions YouTube page. Um, this, we have a citizen science playlist. Um, so you can actually find this and many other of our citizen science lectures right there. Um, and then last thing, I just want to give a shameless plug. I hope that's okay. Um, as I mentioned to you guys, I am on the board of directors for Bay County Conservancy. Um, I would be remiss if I did not not mention that we have a annual meeting coming up on Saturday. Uh, so this is to recruit new members uh, and a variety of other things that we're going to be doing that day. Um, if you want to come and find out a little bit about uh, the Northwest Florida's only land trust, it's a land bank mitigation and preservation bank, uh, we would love to, to have you at our event right here. Um, and so I think that's it, other than perhaps um, allowing, uh, uh, did Baywatch want to say anything? I want to just mention my partners then Baywatch, also hosting for this particular seminar. Um, and and I, would, I would just like to take this moment and thank this young lady here, Christina, our team leader, and all of those in that team that went out there and got that mud and did all that work. They did a great job. I wasn't involved. All I did was write the report. These guys, they did it. And they did a terrific job. And this was first time sediment sampling. So they, I can't thank them enough. Well, Mike was really the brain behind it. Thank you.